The next session is what we're calling Keeping an AI for Transforming Industries and Society. AI for Social Good has emerged as a transformative force revolutionizing industries and society at large. In the next session, we will be joined by a very special guest. I'm guessing we'll be patching him in. Romesh Vadwani, a visionary entrepreneur and philanthropist who will share his insights on the responsible use of AI for industry, transformation, and societal well-being. Mr. Vadwani, what an absolute pleasure to have you join us here at the Tech Today Congress. Delighted to be here. Mr. Vadwani, I'd like to start off by asking you about the advent of AI over the past few months. When we talk about AI, it's interesting because you've really been talking about AI synonymously with Chat GPT and Google Bard because now we have a face for AI. But you set up something in 2018, uh, which was Vadwani AI in Mumbai, India's first AI research institute. And the whole concept seems to have changed. We were just doing a session where we spoke about how it's rapidly evolved. How has your plan changed with Vadwani and what you're doing across the foundation for social good? Um, the plan has absolutely accelerated uh, because of generative AI. And perhaps to put it in perspective, I can give you a little historical context here about AI because sure. most people didn't really pay much attention to AI till just recently because of chat GPT and you know, other uh, similar uh, large language models and chatbots. But interestingly, my own journey with AI began more than 50 years ago. So I went to uh, IIT Bombay, got my degree in electrical engineering, came to the US, went to Carnegie Mellon University. Turned out that in 1970 in Carnegie Mellon University, two of the professors were there were the among the pioneers of the fledgling start of AI technology, uh, the Herb Simon and Alan Noel were two of the many professors that I had the privilege of working with. And that's kind of where my interest in the then AI began. Subsequently, after graduating with my PhD from Carnegie Mellon University, I started my first company 10 years my second company was called American Robot, and that was in the 1980s with the then primitive hardware compared to what's available today. Uh, I began to use AI in high precision robots and also used AI to create the world's first artificial uh, vision system that could be used in factories in conjunction with robots to help them see and perform better in, in the work that robots do in factories. And then in the 90s, when I was building Aspect Development, we were building one of the first companies using the concepts of big data and enterprise software applied to the supply chain. I began to use pattern recognition, similar to what you would consider to be the basis of AI models in that company. And then in the 2000s, when I was building Symphony Technology Group into a group that grew to about two and a half billion in revenue, we used AI in a number of the companies that I was building inside Symphony Technology Group. Now in 2017, uh, I kind of felt that the AI journey had gone through a whole bunch of ups and downs. There were years in which VCs were willing to invest any amount in AI companies, and there were decades in which the VCs ran away as fast as possible from the word AI. So there was actually something called the AI winter in the 1990s and the 2000s where these companies were simply not interested in investing. However, in 2017, I felt that the business to consumer platforms such as you know Google and Meta and Alibaba and others were successfully using AI as part of their B2C platforms, part of their recommendation engines and so on. And yet I felt that the business enterprise was a laggard in using AI technology. So I thought maybe there was an opportunity here to build a couple of great companies that would be leaders in enterprise AI and simultaneously start using AI in my foundation 
to apply AI for social good. So on one side, through the companies, apply it for business good. On the other side, apply it for social good. This is the AI revolution. There's no other point in the last 50 years I can think of where I felt that AI would be world-changing, game-changing, but I do feel that way right now. And it's partly because of the power. Yeah, it's the power of today's technology, but even more than that, speed. The speed with which it is evolving. So sorry for that long answer to your question. That's all right. Yeah. Mr. Vadvani, Mr. Vadvani, you're joining us all the way from Palo Alto. And of course, there's so much action happening in the U.S. There's a lot of news coming in from China in terms of their investment in the AI space as well. So you're calling this an AI revolution. But I'd like to understand where does India stand in this particular AI race? An excellent question. And uh, I've thought about it quite a bit. And uh, uh, I was in India in February uh, about three months ago discussing exactly this topic uh, with a uh, number of key uh, business leaders, uh, political leaders, as well as my foundation team. And my feeling is it is not only India's great opportunity, but actually it is India's responsibility to be one of the top three players in AI. Now, can India be number one or number two? At least at this stage, I don't see it. But can India be number three in the world in AI? That is absolutely possible. Now, to do that isn't going to just happen accidentally. It's going to require massive national scale initiatives for the application of AI, ministry by ministry, program by program. Uh, and just as digital transformation has played a big role in India's progress over the last few years with you know, national platforms like Aadhaar and UPI and others, uh, I think there's need for an AI transformation of many programs that the Indian government has or could have and could plan. But I'm glad that you're at least saying that India gets a podium finish. We've had panelists who think otherwise we might just be number one in that AI race. But we were talking about an AI special magazine issue, which the Business Today team has worked on, and there's an exclusive conversation with Stuart Russell, one of the signatories to that particular open letter that we were alluding to earlier. And he's actually said that if guardrails are not in place, then it could be like a Chernobyl-like situation for AI. Is that genuinely a concern? Do we need regulation? Or should we then risk a situation like Mr. Russell's talking about? Yes, I'm of the same view. I, I would just say that the use of the word guardrails is a is very innocent language and probably needs a lot more than guardrails. And I, I'll give okay. you an analogy here. Uh, people have talked about using comparables like the regulation of atomic energy by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Well, the International Atomic Agent, uh, Energy Agency is, first of all, not that effective because we can see that there's been a proliferation of atomic energy in North Korea and emerging in Iran and in Pakistan and other countries. All of them circumvented the rules of the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. And the second thing is atomic energy, uh, energy is much easier to regulate because it takes billions and billions and billions of dollars to create an infrastructure for atomic energy. It takes five billion, ten billion dollars to build a nuclear plant. It takes tens of billions of dollars to build a you know uranium processing plant that can create weapons grade uranium or a plutonium plant. Those those restrictions do not apply to AI. You can uh, the problem is even well meaning companies like Meta have put large language models into open source. So once it's in open source, a bad actor gets it for free, a good actor gets it for free. The bad actor who gets it for free can poison the large language model with only a small amount of training data that is bad data. It's dangerous data, but you can corrupt these large language models with relatively small amounts of data, which is I'm using the word poison data, and uh, it can be done for hundreds of dollars with one smart hacker sitting in a you know bedroom somewhere, anywhere in the world. So the barrier to 
creating AI that can create a lot of damage is extremely low. The barrier to creating nuclear weapons and atomic energy plants is extremely high. And that is an imbalance that I don't think people have completely put their heads around yet, but they need to, because for every one country that created a 30-year program to produce, you know, fissionable uranium, one billion people potentially could create bad AI that can do harm for just a few thousand dollars or a few hundred thousand dollars each. I think AI has some parallels to that. It needs to be regulated for safety. It's more than just guardrails. It needs to be regulated for effectiveness. It needs to be regulated for the field of purpose. Because if you're using it for limited scientific purposes, you can give a wider license to innovate. If it's going to be released to 100 million people or 1 billion people, you have to apply far greater, you know, uh, validation and testing of all that. All right, fair enough. Now, when we're talking about artificial intelligence and language learning models, these algorithms rely heavily on data, Mr. Vadvani, and across your work at the Symphony Technology Group, I want to understand how you can actually really make sure that data, privacy, and security are imperative and still leverage the power of AI? That's the key question. I think it's incredibly important because one of the reasons that uh, social networks in the U.S. have succeeded mm -hmm. is because all the data that they use to succeed is free. So in a sense, it's been a devil's bargain, right? On the one hand, the consumer gets to use Facebook or any other social platform for free, uh, and Facebook makes their money through advertising, but to make their money through advertising, they need to sell the private data of the 1 billion or 2 billion uh, consumers who are using the Facebook platform. The same applies to any other social networking platform. So in a sense, consumers have sold their souls in exchange for getting free access to platforms like Facebook. Well, that was fine when social networking was, you know, sort of the, the baseline. But in a world of AI where your data, your personal data can not only be used to benefit you individually, it can also be used to benefit others that you may not want to help, and it can be used to harm others that you do not want to harm. How do you protect that from happening. And I think uh, data privacy laws, similar to what the European Union passed a few years ago, you know, GDPR, I think something like that is needed in the US and in India. Uh, no such privacy re uh, regulations are there in the US today. I'm not fully up to speed on what the privacy regulations are in okay. India, but it's okay. definitely needed. It's safe to say that you think AI has become a disruptive force. And like you said, this is the AI moment. Now, I want you to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing three to five years from now, perhaps. What are the key sectors where we'll actually see disruptions? Because it's clear from our first session that AI is a double-edged sword. While people are worried about how it takes away some repetitive jobs, it might augment existing jobs as well. So I, I, I'll start by answering the question in reverse okay. by indicating a sector in which generative AI is not likely to have a significant jobs impact. And that's really uh, jobs in the agriculture sector, jobs in the construction sector, and blue collar jobs in the manufacturing sector. Uh, I would say that jobs that require information processing, knowledge processing, uh, most white collar jobs, whether they are in the legal sector, the financial sector, the IT sector, the, um, the analysts, the creative community, all these are subject to massive disruption. Now, before I come back and talk about disruption, let me just give you examples of industry sectors where this technology is going to have an impact 
starting now and accelerating literally every week, every month for the next three to five years. So I'll start with life sciences and healthcare. Drug discovery is going to get revolutionized, going to happen much, much faster. Clinical trials, which currently take three years or longer, probably be accelerated down to about 50% of that time. Uh, the personalization of medicine, where drugs can be, uh, uh, you know, sort of targeted for specific individuals, uh, that, that will happen, you know, relatively soon. Uh, now in India, uh, obviously salaries are at very different levels, but in the software sector, there will be a lot of disruption because generative AI can be used to perform the work that is today being performed by junior software engineers or even mid-level software engineers. Three years from now, generative AI will be doing the work of the most senior software engineers. How do they need to change their knowledge and their, their uh, career plans to take advantage as compared to getting disrupted? So massive disruption coming. Unfortunately, that's not something you can regulate. Unfortunately, that's not something you can regulate, but there will be a lot of answers to that question through the course of this Congress. Mr. Vadwani, thank you so much for joining us from Palo Alto. A huge round of applause for our global guests at the signature tech event of business today, the Tech Today Congress.